Revelation chapter 18. And uh, Revelation chapter 18 is really, if you read it, is a great big uh, summary of the, uh, of the book up to this point, or perhaps more accurately, a summary of the war and describing its result. And so we'll read in verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illumined with his glory. Uh, I was thinking about the, this uh, uh, word glory, and it's a thing about uh, biblical words or church words is that they actually lose meaning after a while. We use them so much really not entirely sure what they mean. We just, uh, in some sense, see them in, in a Christian context or something like that. Uh, and this word, uh, glory, the Greek word is doxa, uh, another a good translation for that would be splendor. Splendor. And it, it would uh, convey light. That's what it would convey uh, with that type of translation. It's uh, uh, his presence is uh, 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 one in which a, a glorious light would shine about him. And this angel has this uh, appearance of glory. And it may be the angel of the Lord, maybe Jesus Christ. We can't be entirely sure. If we look uh, in Ezekiel 43 uh, at verses 1 and following, we read this. Then he led me to the gate, the gate facing toward the east, and behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the way of the east, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. That sounds like the book of Revelation right there. And the earth shone with his glory. So here is a, an angel coming uh, with a voice of many waters and who has a splendor, splendorous appearance. And it was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when he came to destroy the city. Now this, Ezekiel, would be referring, of course, to the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, 586 B.C. Uh, but that, uh, uh, the, those words, uh, the uh, fact that John, ha I think, has availed himself uh, with the vocabulary uh, the syntax, so to speak, of this Old Testament passage in Ezekiel to convey what he has to say here in the New Testament. And why would he do that? Well, in some sense, he's trying to take his audience and say, uh, what was being discussed there, there's something like that now being discussed here. If you, if you see what I'm trying to say, the embracing of a different context, a different historical setting, and yet to to bring that forward in time, there's a purpose behind it. And the purpose, I think, is the fact that, again, of the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Verse 2, and he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons, and a prison of every unclean spirit, and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. We get this again. In the Old Testament, out of the Old Testament, Isaiah doing the same thing. Uh, and one said, fallen, fallen is Babylon. Uh, that's, uh, that's pretty close. Huh? Uh, and all the images of her gods are shattered on the ground. Now this uh, comment by Isaiah referenced uh, the uh, geographic Babylon and the Euphrates in which he was prophesying its destruction and the destructions of its gods. But again, John is availing himself of the very words and saying there's something like that going on here too. And uh, the gods of this uh, horrible place called Babylon, this dwelling place of demons and the prison of every unclean spirit, being destroyed. So just as Babylon of old was judged for her idolatry, so the new Babylon is being judged in the same way. Now, Joseph 
Josephus says this about Jerusalem. Remember, he lived at this very time. He watched and he wrote. Not only that, he partook of the events. We couldn't get a, perhaps a better uh, individual to tell us what's going on. And he said, I, there, I shall therefore speak my mind here at once briefly, that neither did any other city ever suffer such miseries nor did any age ever breed, ever breed a generation more fruitful in wickedness than this was from the beginning of the world. Well, he didn't have a very high opinion of the city of Jerusalem and its inhabitants and its leaders, as you can see. Uh, he really was saying exactly what John was saying. This was a filthy, dirty city. He's not talking about paper on the ground. He's talking about the hearts of the leaders of the people. Uh, he goes on in another passage and says, Indeed, that was a time most fertile in all manner of wicked practices, insomuch that no kind of evil deeds were then left undone, nor could anyone so much as divide any bad thing that was new. So deeply were they all infected and strove with one another in their single capacity and in their communities who should run the greatest lengths in impiety toward God. Fascinating. Who would, you know, achieve the, uh, the greatest achievement in their impiety toward God, this city which was supposed to be truly pious, uh, being uh, the city of God itself. It goes on says in another place, I suppose that had the Romans made any longer delay in the coming <coughs> against these villains, the city would either have been swallowed up by the ground opening upon them or been overflowed by water, and they were on a mountain, <laughs> they trip, uh, or else been destroyed by such thunder as the country of Sodom perished by for it had brought forth a generation of men much more atheistical than were those that suffered such punishments. For by their madness it was that all the people came to be destroyed. He calls this uh, community, Jerusalem, atheistical, uh, an old uh, word uh, from several hundred years ago. It's simply meaning they were the biggest atheists he could put his uh, finger on, so to speak. Again, he is calling his people, his city, that one city in its uh, arrogance, perhaps, and its pride, proclaimed itself to be the most religious and godly city on the face of the earth. And it was certainly called to that. And yet he calls it the most, most uh, atheistical city. Uh, and that uh, is so bad, he says, that the Romans hadn't done what they did, he expected the, uh, the, the earth to open and swallow them, uh, or, uh, or for them to suffer destruction like Sodom and Gomorrah did. Uh, well deserved, being his point. And of course, and then the book of Revelation turns around and calls Jerusalem Sodom. And so you, it's interesting how Josephus is very vocabulary, and the vocabulary of John is so similar. Uh, verse 3, For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. Now, we're introduced to, to a couple uh, topics here that continue through the rest of this summary, the rest of this chapter. And one is the corruption involved in the uh, political alliances, kings of the earth. And the other are the merchants that are discussed here. In fact, I find it fascinating that most of what is said in this chapter is about uh, wealth. You think most of what is being said would be about idolatry, about uh, thing, you know, things to do with religion, shall we say. 
and yet the great majority of what is said through the rest of this chapter is about the corruption of their wealth, of their money, the things that they desired more than anything else, and what they did to get it, and how sorrowful uh, th those around them were when the city was destroyed because it was a hub of economic activity for the area, critically re uh, located between Syria and Egypt, and uh, part of what was known as the Fertile Crescent. Uh, it was a narrow strip to some degree, because you had the uh, Mediterranean Sea on one side, you had basically a, a desert on the other side, and through this narrow strip, armies and merchants for millennia had marched up and down this strip. And this became a critical highway for the transportation of goods. They either went by sea, or they arrived by sea, or they went up and down these highways from Egypt into Asia Minor, or from Asia Minor down into Egypt, and Jerusalem was a hub of activities in which uh, caravans of camels and things of this nature would arrive in which there would be hundreds of camels laden with goods, some to be sold right there in Jerusalem and, and Israel and others um, taken down into Egypt or up into Syria. And so the merchants play a big role in this chapter. Uh, Jeremiah 51 verse 6 says then, Flee from the midst of Babylon, and each of you save his life. Do not be destroyed in her punishment, for this is the Lord's time of vengeance. You remember in Luke that uh, word vengeance was used which, uh, in the sermon of really the uh, Olivet Discourse in which Luke calls it days of vengeance were coming upon the Lord. Christ used those words according to Luke. And uh, for this is the Lord's time of vengeance. He is going to render recompense to her. Babylon has been a golden cup in the hand of the Lord, intoxicating all the earth. The nations have drunk of her wine, therefore the nations are going mad. Suddenly Babylon has fallen and been broken. Wail over her. Bring balm for her pain. Perhaps she may be healed. This is, again, referring to the actual Babylon on the Euphrates some years ago. But the similarities now apply to this new Babylon and called Babylon in the book of Revelation are striking. Uh, verse 4, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out uh, of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive her plagues. Now a couple of things to be said about this. One, we read about the people of God doing just that, coming out of her in Revelation chapter 7. And you notice the phrase, come out of her, my people. Uh, that phrase is, the people of God or my people, that is virtually a technical phrase, uh, and, uh, not just simply a random combination of uh, words, that does indeed refer to the people of God in the Old Testament, and particularly it was used, but it's used in the New Testament as well. Now the fact that the people of God are called out and we see that calling out taking place in Revelation chapter 7. We see Christ in the, in the Gospels telling the people, uh, when you see the city surrounded by armies, get out, you're saying. Now, all this, what I'm trying to say is this fits Jerusalem as Jesus described it. This fits Jerusalem as God describes it, uh, John describes it here. It doesn't necessarily, in any sense, fit Rome. You see, you don't call the people of God out of Rome, per se. You see, and a lot of people want to make Babylon Rome. In fact, I say that most commentators do that, and I've indicated they have, I guess, a sound enough argument, but I don't think it is in harmony with the flow of the book. You see, it, it, it's not that Rome's not mentioned in this book, but it does uh, seem to me to be... Uh, 
taking a uh, uh, a minor player and making Rome uh, the, the focus. The focus is Jerusalem. The focus is my people. In no sense, I don't think you could call uh, uh, Rome my people. Now, I grant you the church was there. And was, uh, those were the people of God. But you remember what Jesus said in Luke 21. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who are in the midst of the city must leave, and those who are in the country must not enter the city, because these are days of vengeance, so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. Uh, there can be no question what Christ was speaking of. He was not speaking of Rome. He was speaking of Jerusalem. And we see those words... These concepts being reproduced here in this chapter, uh, solidifying, I think, the idea that uh, this is Jerusalem under discussion. For her sins, verse 5, have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. And so, basically, it's time for judgment. Look what Jeremiah 51 again says. We applied healing to Babylon, but she was not healed. Forsake her and let us each go to his own country, for her judgments have reached to heaven and towers up to the very skies. See the vocabulary similarities. Do you think John was familiar with Jeremiah and Isaiah? He was deeply familiar with these prophetic books, Ezekiel and Daniel, and alludes to them constantly. Again, bringing the concepts of destruction and such like from the Old Testament context and basically saying, and these same ideas are going to occur in the near future and they're going to occur to Jerusalem. Uh, pay her back even as she has paid and give, her, give back to her double according to her deeds and the cup which she has mixed, mixed twice as much for her. Now, there is a strong condemnation here. Let's look at Exodus 22 and verse 4. If what he stole is actually found alive in his possession, whether an ox or a donkey or a sheep, he shall pay double. Now, the point I'm just trying to make here is paying back double was a biblical uh, concept for when somebody had done something wrong. And God is paying back double. Other actually passages allude to a, a punishment seven times. But uh, seven meaning a perfect punishment against this evil institution. But the, the Old Testament law is being brought forward here to make it clear that a crime has been committed, and a proper punishment for this crime is that she be paid back double what she did. Jeremiah 16, 18 says, I will first doubly repay their iniquity and their sin, because they have polluted my land, they have filled my inheritance with carcasses of their detestable idols and with their abominations. And this is spoken of, of the priests. Uh, and the uh, royal and religious classes of Jerusalem. And, uh, and he says they will be doubly repaid uh, for their sin. And so John embraces these concepts. Jeremiah 17, let those who persecute me be put to shame. But as for me, let me not be put to shame. Let them be dismayed, but let me not be dismayed. Bring on them a day of disaster and crush them with twofold destruction. This is Jeremiah's prayer that Jerusalem would, in his day, would suffer these punishments for their horrible sins. And yet it appears that the Jerusalem of the time of Christ and uh, the early New Testament church was even more corrupt. And, and, and the Jerusalem of the Old Testament would kill the prophets and, 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 the, and the righteous people like Jeremiah. But the, the, the Jerusalem of the first century murdered Christ. 
they were even more corrupt and evil. To the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensuously, and of course this is personification, meaning you uh, take some institution, in this case a city, and address it as a person, uh, to the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensuously, to the same degree give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and am not a widow and will never see mourning. And that is John quoting them thinking that they are uh, beyond judgment. That they cannot be reached for their sin. Uh, but in fact, uh, Isaiah says in 47a, Now then, hear this, you sensual one, who dwells securely, who says in your heart, I am, and therefore is no one beside me. I will not sit as a widow, nor no loss of children. Uh, the illusion by John uh, is, is so great so often. I mean, uh, you wouldn't be surprised if somebody accused him of plagiarism. <laughs> you know? He was using the phrases, obviously so, to make the point. Just as that city thought they could not be reached in judgment, this one thinks the same thing. But in fact, uh, that is uh, not going to be the case. For this reason, in one day, her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for the Lord God who judges her is strong. We've talked about the fact that this city being burned up with fire is stressed over and over again. I'm just wondering if... Uh, there is any other uh, focus on burned up with fire anywhere else in the Bible like it is in Jerusalem here. And, uh, and I think the reason, as I've discussed before, is found in Leviticus 21.9, also the daughter of any priest, if she profanes herself by harlotry, and of course, what is this person called by John, a harlot? She profanes herself for harlotry. She profanes her father. She shall be burned with fire. And so Jerusalem has profaned herself in harlotry, spiritual and biological harlotry. And uh, the most severe of all judgments comes upon one with this priestly standing before God. And no other city had such a royal priestly standing where the temple of God itself stood. And... Uh, where, where Christ was so displeased with their worship. One of the things he was most displeased with, remember on two different occasions, he drove the money changers from the temple. And remember I said, in this chapter stresses money. It stresses uh, uh, the uh, material aspects of life. How important they were to Jews where the spiritual aspect was neglected. I don't know if you've noticed uh, in the, the news or the media this week, but there were several rabbis in New Jersey who were arrested by the FBI, involved in various kinds of criminal activity between uh, New Jersey and Israel, where they were, uh, and I don't know how they were doing or what the exact charge is. But millions of dollars were being stolen and being transferred through the banking system and such like. And the rabbis were doing it. You see? Well, and others were involved. But, and they showed pictures of them. The big beards and the funny hats and all you know the garments that the rabbis wear in handcuffs because of the corrupt greedy nature of these so-called religious and, and of course, Jews aren't the only one that are corrupt and steal. There are plenty of Protestants and, and every other religion 
that still their congregation is blind. This thing. But it is, the point is that the chapter makes this point more than it, virtually any other point as we continue reading through it. Uh, verse 9. And the kings of the earth who committed acts of immorality and lived sensuously with her will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, Whoa, whoa, the great city, Babylon, the strong city, for one hour your judgment has come. Now those kings of the earth, of course, uh, uh, you know, the question is, which kings are they? It's very easy if you're making this to be Rome to say, well, Rome obviously uh, reigned over the kings of the earth in that application. But when did Rome burn? When does this apply to Rome? Your future, she'll say it'll be somewhere in the distant future, but Rome was long since to be a, a world power. It's, I mean, that, I, I can't imagine even a future application. You might say New York or London or Tokyo or something, but Rome is just not on the, the horizon anymore that this would be applicable to them. But it's quite applicable to Jerusalem in this first century. Kings of the earth then would be the kings in Israel, the kings around Israel, and uh, the kings down in Egypt and up in Syria and across the uh, empire that benefited through that relationship financially. And since Jerusalem was perhaps second only to Rome in size, in the uh, first century, it's a very large town, city, not much smaller than Rome itself. Its economic significance was, uh, you know, almost beyond description. And that the uh, comments of this chapter fit nicely. Uh, Verse 11, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. And it describes all those cargoes. Interestingly, it describes the cargoes in detail of all the elements and all the things and all the wealth and everything people had set their heart on. And it's being destroyed. And these merchants are unhappy because... Uh, they're losing their wealth. Uh, now, uh, if we look at uh, John 2.15, we are reminded what I said about uh, Jesus. He made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables and so this has precedent in the ministry of Jesus himself, this uh, judgment, this attack, and the greediness of the merchants. How they would bring their trade right into the temple itself. And of course, why, why could they do that? Because they paid royalties to the priests, to the powers that they, the high priests. They get a certain, you know, it's like, I, I don't know if it's like a... Uh, going to a jockey lot, if you rent a space, or, or, or if you gave a percentage, I don't know, that's all I know, it was in the, they thought it was in their financial best interest to, to flood the temple complex with the, these people who were basically ripping off of the population, because they had to buy a sheep for sacrifice, unless you wanted to to drive one, you know, 50 or 100 miles to Jerusalem, uh, what you do is bring money. And you'd buy one. But you couldn't buy one just anywhere. Because the priests had to approve it. They had to check it out and approve it. And you want to guess what was going to happen if you brought your own sheep in there that you, you know, brought to Jerusalem or bought somewhere else in Jerusalem? Oh, no, that one doesn't. So I'm sorry. What are they doing? You better, now, these over here are better fruit. Yes, say, so you're going to have to go over there and buy one for sacrifice. Meaning, 
I'm going to make a buck on that one. I'm not making anything on that job. They were just approved. You see, crooked to the depths of their heart, money grabbing thieves. And that is what Jesus uh, is attacking here, and that's their judgment to a large degree. Verse 21. Then a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence, and it will not be found any longer. It's a picture of utter destruction. <coughs> and notice what Josephus says about Jerusalem after the war had ended. It, meaning the city of Jerusalem, was so thoroughly laid even with the ground by those that dug it up to the foundation that there was left nothing to make those that came thither believe it had ever been inhabited. That's how much destruction that went on. They dug it up Stone by stone by stone, those walls, that temple, you know, uh, that great mass of city, and you remember that virtually the only thing they can find 2,000 years later is that place they call the Wailing Wall. It's about the only thing they found left. That's how thoroughly the city was plowed under. And then the Romans also had a, uh, another nice thing that did. All of the fields, uh, of course, they cut down all of the trees and crops and everything. And then they would sow salt in the earth. Large quantity. Bring it in. They go to the trouble of bringing it in by boat loads so that they could go out there and salt down the fields for miles around so nothing could grow. You know, just <laughs> uh, I don't know what you call that. It was Sweet. vengeance. <laughs> you know. Now we're going to plow this city under so nobody can even tell it was a city. All the farms around for as far as we care to, we're going to salt them down with salt so that nothing will grow in them. And it took dozens and dozens of years for the rain to rain out that salt before it ever grew again. Uh, that was a pretty vindictive act. Now, one question might be asked in this phrase, uh, and it says, and will not be found any longer. Well, it wasn't found any longer after uh, Rome did what it did, but obviously Jerusalem was rebuilt uh, in time. And would perhaps a literalist, and they're, they're pretty common in those that interpret the uh, book of Revelation, literalists would look at this and say, well, there's an uh, error here in the Bible. Because it is found later. And I think the uh, point is that the Jerusalem, which was the apple of God's eye, the spiritual center of his kingdom up to this point, was destroyed and was never to be found again. Now that's a significant point. Not whether there was a physical city built later, but was there a spiritual city built later? Because what do we have in especially American Christianity today, but this great hope, I guess, to rebuild and refound a spiritual Jerusalem with a new temple, with animal sacrifice, and in some way, shape, or form, view all this as a good thing. If we're going to go defy God and build a temple and offer animal sacrifice, and, oh, can I help? Can I help? You know, I'll give you some money. Dispensationalists are nuts. I want to be involved in this rebellion against God. That's all that is. We're going to defy God and deny Christ ever came and build a new temple and offer animal sacrifices because we're still waiting on the Messiah. We cursed the one that came and murdered him, and we're glad we did it. But if you'll help us, we'll, we'll do, do it again. Well, sure, I'll help. Are there a bigger group of people on the globe that are as stupid as Christians? I'm not sure that there are. <laughs> you know? Uh, so, this Jerusalem was found no longer. It was replaced by another Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, the Church of Jesus Christ. 
valid, important point, I, I do believe, considering the theology of our era in which we live. Let's read 1 Peter 2, 5, and then 9 through 10. You also, as living stones, says Peter, a Jew, to the church of Jesus Christ, are being built up as a spiritual house. Now, what do you think a spiritual house meant to a Jew? They meant that temple. And Paul even calls the church, what, the temple of God. Okay. He wasn't talking about buildings. He's talking about the body. Built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. Now, that's fascinating vocabulary, holy priesthood. Jews knew what a priesthood was. Peter was transforming that to non, not only non-Jews, non-Levites. Gentiles, you're the holy priesthood. What heresy? To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, but you are a chosen race. Oh, but get the stones out. That's it. He's gone over the line now. He's calling somebody other, a Jew, other than a Jew, a chosen race. He's calling the church. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Now you are the people of God. And that phrase, people of God, meant a lot to a Jew. My word, he better make sure he is writing this from a Gentile community. Because if a Jew's got a hold of that, they'd kill him in a heartbeat. You see? And what is Peter saying? The church is the people, are the people of God. You know, Peter's not trying to take up a collection to rebuild a temple. You're saying the temple is being built and the community of faith. How hard is this to get? Paul, what does he say? Galatians 6 16. And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. He's addressing the Galatians. Now, if there ever was a Gentile church, probably the Galatians were it. But they were all. Know, Gentile churches, uh, and he calls these people the Israel of God. Well, when everybody's talking about Israel, and a lot of talk about Israel, just remember who Paul says is Israel, who Peter says is the people of God. It's the church of Jesus Christ. Matthew, Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, as he addressed this, the Jews, and given to a people producing the fruit of it. That was not an esoteric message. He just came right out and said, I'm taking away your status as the people of God. I'm giving it to somebody else who will bring forth fruit because you haven't done it. You failed. And <clears throat> so, uh, many more Verses that deal with the merchandise and the wealth of the community are shared uh, in this chapter. And then verse 24, And in her, Jerusalem, was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who have been slain on the earth. That's another reason why this is such a horrible place. And so Matthew 23 says, Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous bloodshed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah the son of Erechtiah whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. You can reinterpret the generation to your heart's content, but whatever you come up with other than a 40-year period from that point, you got it wrong. All of this was to happen in that generation. And what does chapter 18 of the book of Revelation do? It just summarizes and describes exactly what Christ said would happen. 